Hello everyone, welcome to the Phoenix Phenomenon. I'm your host, ghostwriter Roxanne McCarty O'Kane. Thank you for joining us for another episode where we delve into the transformative process of becoming an author and talk to the change makers who know this journey all too well. Today I'm joined by Aaron Creamer, who also goes under the pen name of AJ Creamer. He's a qualified chef, teacher, and study philosophy before deciding to fulfill a long-held passion for writing by becoming an author. He recently released his debut novel, A Decent Life, Stories of the Broken and Corrupt. Aaron is a passionate writer who enjoys mixing philosophy with literature and creating characters close to the people we have all met and interact with on our daily lives. His work is honest and well thought out mixed with a deep-seated philosophical concept we grapple, grapple with each and every day. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Awesome intro. I hope I live up to my uh, introduction. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I really, really would love to know a lot more about your book. But first of all, I'd love for you to share with, um, with myself and with our listeners and viewers um, about the path that led you to where you are today. Um, because, you know, you've, you've had a various um, mixture of careers there, <laughs> dabbled in mixed martial arts, um, also lived in a, a few different states as you were growing up as well. So just love for mm. you to, I guess, take us on that journey with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Newcastle originally, New South Wales, and um, it doesn't sort of start very well. Like I ended up you know, with drugs and alcohol and whatnot. Um, which is then I went to the Northern Territory. My uncle was in the Air Force. He was on the Tyndall Air Base. So I lived with him for a while and tried to sort myself out, which didn't, didn't <laughs> go very well. Um, and then I returned home to Newcastle. Um, and thankfully, I think a big saviour was my friend's dad was a chef. Um, and so I got an apprenticeship through him and that's how I became a chef. So I worked in that field for you know, probably 10 years thereabouts, um, but obviously still drank a lot you know, use drugs regularly and thankfully found martial arts. I met my wife, we got married and I started martial arts and just got that discipline. Um, and then when I started running businesses, like hospitality is just insanity. Um, yeah, so you'd be doing 60, 70 hour weeks and just randomly the Pasha Bolka crashed um, like 500 meters from my restaurant. So we went from doing like 80 people to like 400 um, so <laughs> wow. <laughs> it, yeah, it was not, that was a very rough summer, but anyway, got through it. And then as I had kids, I just didn't want to work those sort of hours. So I went into teaching, um, and kept that martial arts, the discipline side of things. So yeah, it sounds like a very strange lineup, but it, it sort of makes sense. <laughs> One rolled to the other. Um, and then most recently I just thought I've gone back to three days a week work. My wife and I work part time and I've always loved writing, I love heavy metal and music lyrics and all that sort of stuff. So I thought, let's do it, let's go. <laughs> Excellent. But yeah. of course you were at university as well in the mix there um, also. So I was curious to find out yeah. what it was that drew you to philosophy in particular. Yeah, same deal where I've always, like I always like those questions like, you know, what are we doing here, point of existence? You know, do you really, are things, is it fate or destiny? It's one of the chapters in my book is all about chance, destiny, fate. Those things really interest me, um, you know, determinism, whether you, you know, what makes you Roxanne and what makes me Aaron, like that's you know, an interesting question. So yeah, same deal, just at that weird stage of life, well not weird, I suppose, but I'm 38, you know, I've got a bit of money, I'm not struggling too bad and I've got a bit of time. And so I just thought I'm gonna do the things I wanna do. Mm. Um, and it definitely helped my writing, like especially vocabulary, having the exact specific word I want for that exact specific concept. Um, so that was, yeah, that's how that fit in. Yeah. Absolutely. Just doing and so, the things I want to do basically. <laughs> yeah, no, perfect. And good on you for, for yeah. going through the list and, and marking them off. That's amazing. Yeah. A few big ones left, but yeah, on the, on the, on the hunt. So. Ooh, okay. That's <laughs> intriguing. <laughs> Excellent. And so, um, when was it that the seed for becoming an author was first planted for you? Was there a particular catalyst or something that happened that, that gave you the idea? Um, not I, like I remember as a child, I just loved books and even like album covers. Um, like I'm a massive heavy metal fan. Like I just, I love metal. I've even got my machine head shirt on now. I like, love it. Um, 
and even like writing was the thing like, to be honest i'm just lucky it's just something that i can do um like when i watch someone draw like my, <laughs> my drawing is so bad like even a stick figure you're like what, what is he trying to do is it a stick man what? Um, like my daughter's, my youngest one's like seven and her skill is about nine times my drawing skill. So when I watch people draw, it's like, whoa, how do you do that? And I, I just, it's just a natural talent, I guess. Um, so, but then to actually write a book, I think that self-discipline of martial arts just mm. kicks in. Um, so even this morning when I was, I was dropping my kids at school, I got half an hour and I just punched out about a thousand words and, and edited some chapters. So just, you know, just that discipline, I guess, was the final thing. But yeah, there wasn't like a pivotal moment where I thought I'm going to do this. It just it sounds weird to say it out loud. It just sort of happened. Like I just, just done it. So yeah. I have a lot of others. I have 12 titles. Um, I have number one finished, number two finished, and number three is about 60,000 words in for a decent life series. So. Yes, I did notice on your website, you've got, you've at least listed four, four more titles yet to come. And I'm like, man, this guy's on a mission. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I'm not, well, I really love one of those is the wolf and I. So I took the concept of a werewolf and then took um, like the process of addiction. And so the same thing that you go through with addiction, the werewolf goes through as like, you know, a beast, like a monster. I love that book. But um, I just, because a decent life is a series, I sort of went with that first and I was on a roll and it was the most completed. So and I've got awesome reviews. So it was a good move. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so you mentioned um, discipline was obviously a huge part of your writing process. Can you share a little bit about what, what a routine would look like for you? Yeah, sure. Um, so the first thing I, for myself, I definitely have a tendency to be like too full on. So I just, when I'm tired, I just have to accept now I'm tired and it's not working. But yeah, generally I fit it in where I can. So of a morning, so I drop my, my children at school, I might write for an hour or so, go for a jog, come back and edit what I've written. Or, you know, if my daughter does swim school, like I'll drop her at swim school and I'll write, you know, for half an hour. But generally every day I would try and do, you know, at least at least an hour. But um, if it's not flowing, I've just learned to accept now it's, you know, it's not there. Mm. Um, but even editing, I, I really enjoy editing. Um, I was listening to Jordan Peterson, the psychology professor, and he was saying he went through every word of every line of his book several times. And I was like, yeah, challenge accepted. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, people for my first novel, a lot of people have said, you know, the quality of the writing. I'm like, well, it is my first novel, but it's kind of like my eighth or ninth because I've edited it like just a ridiculous amount of time. So mm. yeah, it's like a good way to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> say that it's just being very thorough <laughs> so. yeah yeah and just yeah. I don't know I enjoy it so it kind of feels like the writing and the editing is the easy part it's more the uh you know presenting it at market being face to face doing interviews they're the things I'm less comfortable with so oh, pretty common doing... author trait <laughs> yeah it is it is but you are doing very well today so you're yeah you've obviously <laughs> had a bit of practice already a little bit yeah, yeah. Excellent. That's great. And so tell me about um, about the characters that you were able to create for, for the first book, book one, that's already out. Um, you've mentioned that you do model them around, you know, the everyday people that we do come across with um, various character traits and personalities. So were, were they inspired by people you've come across in your own life or were they all very fictionalised? Um, they're definitely fictionalised, but there's, um, as a chef, like I'll work roughly with like 40 people a shift and then it's such a transient industry. So I've worked with people from like all over the world um, and, you know, who like just all different countries, different sexualities, all different walks of life from, you know, uni students to, to literal people out of rehab. So I've had a really broad selection of people to sort of, which I didn't realise at the time, like it was in my 20s, like, you know, you just whatever, get through the shift. So there wasn't like, I haven't like, uh, you know, fictionalised an actual person, but I've taken different traits of people. But mm -hmm. yeah, the main character is, so it's written in a first person narrative primarily. So you're kind of inside the, the, the mind of the main character, but he doesn't, I can't tell you his name because it's like a catch at the end. So I'm just going to have to say the main character. Um, and uh, have you seen this TV series on Netflix called, I think it's called You? Yes. 
Yeah, so it's similar, similar vein. If you cross you with Fight Club, I'm in, I'm in that realm somewhere. That's, That's awesome. Sort of, yeah, that dark, twisted narrative thing. So, um, and a lot of his, so he, the philosophy part of his thoughts are obviously from a lot of the course I've studied. Um, and yeah, it's hard to say because it's all, heaps of it's anonymous. So I don't want to wreck it for people. But the female character is brutal. I don't, I wanted to make her like really strong. Um, I do read or see like female characters where they're sort of um, like meandering or weak. I'm like, I don't know what girls you hang out with, but the girls I know are not like that. <laughs> yeah, they'll fire up. So yeah, yeah, she's, um, yeah. Again, it's a hidden plot theme, but she's very, very integral to the whole thing. So. Awesome. So yeah. much intrigue there. Um, I can see a lot of people going, yeah. oh, I want to find out more. So. Well, it's one, unfortunately, it's one of those stories, if I sort of, like everything links to the other and it, there's a lot of concept of time, like you'll see the, you know, the cover obviously is, is time. Um, and so it's interlinked in a way, if I sort of unravel one thing, it'll, it'll spoil a whole heap of it. But of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. As good writing should be. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, I come across lots of different um, processes that authors have, you know, particularly with a complex plot like yours. Um, are you a planner or do you sit down and just let it flow? I, yeah, I've done both and I've had really good success with both. And I also feel silly saying how good my writing is, just as a side note. <laughs> oh, no, it's, <laughs> um, it's marketing so, practice, AJ. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, so this book was largely, I knew the start and I knew the end and the middle was kind of discovery writing. And mm -hmm. I actually got to, I could tell you the exact chapter, but it was roughly two thirds of the way through. And the end third, the ending, I was, I just, it felt cliche and just like boring nearly. And so I just cut it out. I still have it. I'm using it for writing workshops. Um, and I completely changed the end and it was, it was just like a thousand times better. So much better. But um, obviously that's nerve wracking too. You're nearly finished and you're like, no, nah, no, nah, not ha largely discovery writing. But I have another book. It's a historical um, nonfiction. So I made my own Bush Ranger and inserted him into 1800s Australia, mm -hmm. sort of 1850s. So that was a lot of research because I wanted it to be historically accurate. So that was um, a lot more planned out. But yeah, generally probably more discovery writing, but I know the start and I know the end and I just see where it goes yeah that's so yeah. awesome and yeah. so your decent life series are the same two main characters going to continue on through the series or is it going to be a completely um completely like a different plot? yeah so part way through that book two police officers are in the um are in the story and the second one follows them mm -hmm. um and then apart from those two everyone else is new so the second one, I'll give one thing away. It's essentially nine short stories that interlink over each other and you, you basically walk through the this world, which <laughs> I can't explain it. I'm going to wreck it. No, it's, uh, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then so basically book two ends um, where book one ends sort of thing. So those characters in book one come into it in book three. Yeah. That's, so that's amazing. What I, and so did you did you set out to create a series or as you were writing book one did you see all of these all of this potential for other stories to evolve around it um, I knew I was going to do corruption chaos and then order it's three different themes and I just had no idea what I was doing so I thought I'd fit it in one book and then I, <laughs> I was like only at the corruption part and you're up to 80 or 70 thousand words or whatever and I was like oh actually I'm not going to write a 300,000 word book. That's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, three books, but I'll, I'll, I think I'll end up probably doing six in the series because there's two um, from the second book, there's two plot arcs that are really interesting. So I'll come back to them and I've left them open purposefully now. So I'm, I'm getting better as I'm going. I can, I can, yeah. You know, learning process. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, and, and you're doing all of this, this is what's blowing my mind. You're doing all of this while still working part time. As yeah, a I still work. I'm a high school teacher. Um, and I've done a degree. So I've done a, like a broad education degree. So I'm actually I actually reached out today to the Indigenous Literacy Council. So I'm hoping to do some work with Indigenous, um, you know, literacy. And 
even schools around this area have had interest in writing workshops, but because of coronavirus, I can't go onto campus at the moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at the moment, I still work three days. So again, it sounds strange, but my energy level is like 10 out of 10. And like, I used to run and do martial arts every day, but I, I injured my knee doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And so I just haven't been able to keep that level of intensity up physically. And I'm 38, which isn't old, but I, I could do get sore now. So <laughs> didn't used to get sore. Um, so I've just got this energy. I don't know what to do. So I just write stories. So, and then the better I've gotten, I don't have to edit as much. So my content's higher, editing's less. Yeah. So, yeah. It sounds impressive, I guess. I don't know what else I'd be doing though. Like a garden, but you know, yeah, need something with a bit more intensity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And so take me back to the moment when you, um, you know, you've put in all this work, you've done all this editing, um, you decided to um, go independent publishing. So you've gone through the publishing journey as well. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like to hold that first physical copy of, of oh, your yeah. in your hand? Yeah. yeah, that was cool. Even doing the, um, like, um, just yeah. that yeah. and looking through it, that was a cool moment. I think out of anything I've done, um, having like watching my daughter be born, my first daughter, well, not the first was better than the other two, but watching my daughter be birth was uh, just freaking amazing, man. Like mind blowing. Um, see a little like a first breath and everything. I don't think anything would uh, would equal that moment. And then, because my wife will watch this, I'll say marriage, my wedding day was number two. But yeah. holding my book was probably a close, close behind that one, I think. Um, yeah, it's cool. I, I, I love it. I love it. I think if I could, especially if I end up with all 12 or 15 titles, that would be, you know, like, well, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then I've even thinking lately, like the very worst case, what's the worst thing? Even if I've done it as a hobby, I can still achieve that. So even if that was the worst thing, that's still freaking amazing. So Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you say even if you do it as a hobby, are you looking for this to be like the authorship to be your full time gig? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. So I would, like I said before, I like have still got some things to do. Mm -hmm. I would love for like any any um, like movie, Netflix, anything like this in that multimedia industry to take up take up my book. That would be like, yeah, <laughs> that would be a very big goal. That would be a very happy hour in that day. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, you know, yeah. But I, I always like to look at the best thing and the worst thing, and then I can sort of judge my own progress off off that scale. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you mentioned that you launched on the first of August. So, yeah. um, in really tough times, let's be honest, in in the world <laughs> at the moment. Um, but tell me, tell me about some of the amazing feedback that you have been getting from from the people who are picking up a copy and and reading. Yeah, I did. Yeah, launched 1st of August. So June 12 was the original date. And that was New South Wales was in lockdown. My, my friend, when I was a chef, I worked with a chef named Emerson Rodriguez. Um, I was an apprentice. He was a sous chef. And so I held my um, event at his winery. But um, it was closed at that time. So was, mm. I think the plague was probably worse for writing. But this isn't far behind that, really. Like, bookshops are shut. You can't go to markets and you know, whatever. Yeah. But um, yeah, I actually had a lot of students I've taught previously. They're like 23, 24 now. Some of them have children and stuff. So they've been really supportive because um, some of them obviously have a really tough time in high school. And um, I've helped, like off the top of my head, probably six or seven people get into like, um, hospitality or into the army with cookery or the Navy, um, things like that. So I've got great feedback from them. and. A strange thing, I, ne I just never thought of it, but because the main character in book one is the female and she's like really strong and like she can be cold, like she's quite brutal. Um, so they, a lot of them, young women really related to that, which wasn't like purposeful on my behalf. It's just, that's the character. That's what, you know, what would she do? Well, she'd probably smoke him. She's not going to deal with that rubbish. Yeah. And so I've got lots of feedback on that and people like, <laughs> So they become vigilantes. That's one of the things they do. And because it's written first person narrative, some of my friends were like, man, what is some of this real? Or like, what, are you, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm not stalking around the streets, killing people in my spare time. It's a story. Yeah. I, I took it as it was good writing, if they think it's real. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also worried what they think about me, but you know. <laughs> oh, no. 
I wouldn't let that be a concern at all. Uh, actually, actually, while we're on that train of thought, um, I do ask every one of our guests, you know, that the show is called The Phoenix Phenomenon and how, um, how evolution occurs every time someone writes a book, either, either it's personal evolution, for those who are writing it for a business, it could be business evolution. Um, but I wanted to find out how it was that you, you felt that you changed as a person perhaps while writing your book. Was there any new things you discovered about yourself um, in the process? Mm, that's a really interesting question. I'm definitely, um, I don't know the word, content, or happy, like proud, I suppose, of actually completing it. Mm -hmm. That would be one thing. Definitely my evolution in my writing skills and my communication. Um, not that I was poor before because I've done degrees and I have, you know, I teach for, but it's a very specific type of um, skill. Mm. So definitely that. But I think probably out of anything, the ability to just scrap stuff, um, like the last third of my book to just yeah. go, no, nah, that's not good enough. And having that, you know, if it's in my view, if it's not 10 out of 10, I'm not doing it. I'm just not. Mm. Um, probably that's the, the main thing, which is kind of nerve wracking, but you know, and aren't subjective, obviously. Other people might read it and think it's not 10 out of 10, and that's fine. That's another thing I've had to learn to deal with is rejection. Yeah. Um, thankfully, I have a friend, Russell Thornton. Uh, he does, like, um, cartoons like Peppa Pig. He's a music guy, so he does introductions for, like, Australian cartoons and works with the ABC. And he gave me some good advice that roughly out of 100 people he approaches, he might get four or five responses. And that's as an established person in his industry with you know a re impressive resume yeah. so that kind of changed my mindset to just you know just approach everyone if they say no they say no mm. you know, whatever <laughs> everyone's busy aren't they everyone's busy they're all doing stuff like i get it yeah no that's it and i'm i'm really excited to hear that you know because a lot of um authors i do have on the show like even established authors who have publishing contracts and all sorts of stuff, they go through that phase of self-doubt and, you know, yeah. is it good enough? Like, why am I doing this? Um, yeah, but it yeah. sounds like you um, had a pretty, pretty strong grip on, on all of that. I think I definitely have self-doubt though. It's just, I really want to be an author. So I just have to ignore it. Like um, Joshua Clifton at Ocean Reef Publishing helped me a lot with that. Because, yeah, that's right. Like, someone might read it and go, what is this shit? Like, what are you talking about? Murder, you know? Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, maybe they think that. So be it, you know? And, and getting those first reviews, um, the lady in my book, Chris Romano, I worked with, she gave me some feedback and that really spurred me on. So I had it done for a while and I was like, I, I don't know, like, who do I, how do you even find a publisher? How do you do this? What money do I need to put in? How do you get a contract? It's, you know? There's a lot of variables in there. Like, um, and then I did approach Penguin and they weren't, um, they, they rejected it. Um, but it was in that, you know, when you just submit like open submissions. Yeah, yeah. And so everyone told me, even other authors were like, it's, it's just such a lucky dip. Mm. Um, it doesn't go to the genre reader and it might not even get read. It just gets kicked under a desk. And again, like they're pulling in whatever their income is, billions of dollars. Like I get it there. You know, they're busy. Everyone's busy, aren't they? Everyone's doing stuff. Yeah. You just yeah. got to make enough noise so you're like, <laughs> listen to me. You know, read this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I've heard many, many stories of you know people going their own way, like you have, and then they suddenly they've got the attention of the publishers. You know, that they're, they're standing yeah. up, and taking notice. Yeah. So just because yeah. you've gone indie publishing doesn't mean you've discounted any other options going forward. So No, yeah, I've been listening to JP Penn, the um, English author, and she was actually talking about that recently. I love her podcast. Awesome. Um, just information that you would never know, you know, she knows from 10 years of being an author. And so it sort of helps me, mm. you know, pick her brain without ever meeting her. And she was saying that exact thing, like just, you know, independent publishing now is like, really, it's got a lot of, a lot of credibility, doesn't it? Like, um, so she, there's another author, I can't think of his name right now, he's an action author, but he has some titles with publishers and some that are independent. So he has a contract and independent. So I don't know, I think it's a lot more credible now. Um, yeah, and I'll just make sure I present myself professionally. I've got like business cards and flyers and, and nice banners. So I don't want to look like, you know, 
what's the word like in mum and pop operation like you know making moonshine out the back like read this story you know yeah 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 <laughs> yeah and and how have you been finding that like stepping out and you know letting the world know hey i'm an author look at what i'm doing and all the amazing stuff you've got brewing as well and in, in the background um <laughs> i'm getting more comfortable with it yeah you're um being a teacher helps because i talk to people from all different different backgrounds but um talking yeah it is hard it is definitely hard and trying to gauge like some people are very open and loud and confident and other people are quite odd you know, in their mannerisms. And so you've kind of got to pick up quite quick the sort of person you're speaking to. And even the other day at the markets, this lady was interested and I said, oh, it's, it's probably something like in the, in the psychological thriller regime, like um, realm. And she immediately put it down. I was like, I don't read thrillers. I was like, whoa, whoa, that's only the start of my spiel. Come back, come back. <laughs> yeah. um, so then I was like, quickly for the next person, like, don't say that. And so I spoke about the concepts about time and corruption and justice. Um, and so that, because the, the problem for me is my book doesn't fit into a genre. Mm. Like it isn't, I'm sure a lot of books are the same, it's like not specifically dystopian. It's not specifically action. This kind of elements of all of that. So I'll just speak about the uh, concepts now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm learning. That's the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Learning. That yeah. would be my answer. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's amazing. And so um, what would you say would be your top tip for anyone who's watching who, you know, might be still in the aspiring author category? They haven't quite taken the leap yet. What, what would you say yeah. to them? I would probably say three things. Number one would be just do it. Just, just do it. See what happens. Even those um, submissions, they're a massive lot, like maybe a one in a million, but just I'd send it to Penguin Random House. Like, well, they're closed right now, but mm -hmm. Alan and Unwin's open, just approach them, you know, who knows? Who knows? Happens for other people, so. But um, I'll definitely say discipline, like just just hone that, hone that skill. Even right now with coronavirus, I've been thinking, because I could have number two out, but I just, it's not rolling because everything's closed. So I'm just backing my content up. So I'm thinking in five years, seven years, I'll be in the same spot. It's just a lot of the progress will happen, at the, you know, year six rather than year two. Mm. Um, so yeah, that would be my two big things. Yeah. Now, you know, the other good thing now is you, with podcasts, you can access authors like in YouTube, like you can listen to Stephen King and like guys that have made the careers out of it. Mm. So I would listen to those people as well. and. The JP Penn podcast I was talking about, I find her, she's very down to earth. Like she's, you know, says her first book, she failed. She ordered 2000 copies. She was actually in Queensland at the time and thought she was just going to smash it. And, you know, <laughs> and she didn't. So, you know, it's, it's good. I think to hear people that are successful, how they failed. Mm. Yeah. 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 Cause you always think that you, I'll release this book. Netflix will pick it up. We'll be in Hollywood, you know, if you're going to dream, it may as well be big. eh? Well, that's it. And there's not, absolutely nothing wrong with putting that out there because you never know. You really never know. So Yeah, that's what I've been thinking lately. Even like recently I went to a market and only made like a small amount of sales. But I thought you really only need one one sale to the right person. That's really what you're doing, isn't it? Yeah, you're not going to yeah. sell 10,000 books face to face on the streets. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm not anyway. Um, it really, but you know, one person picks it up. Who knows who they are? Like, who knows who their cousin or their brother or whatever? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just getting yourself out there as much as possible, isn't it? Yeah, and I mean, worst case scenario, you've still made a book and you've made art that you love. So that's way better than just you know whatever coming home and drinking on a Wednesday night and getting up for work Thursday and just plodding through. Like that sounds terrifying to me. That's that's way worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right. And so I'd love for you to share with people how they can connect with yourself and get their hands on um, on book one and sort of stay in the loop for when, when they can expect the yeah. other books to be released as well. Absolutely. So I've got my website, which is AJ Creamer. My name's Aaron James. So that's why it's AJ. So Aaron James Creamer. So AJ Creamer author.com. You can find me. Um, and I've absolutely pillaged the internet with anything to do with a decent life or my name. So you can just search a decent life by, with my name and I'll come up. Um, and apart from, 
from that. Any people in Newcastle? I'm stopped um, at Emerson, Emerson's Restaurant at Lovedale, Q's Books at Hamilton, and the Press Coffee House at Hunter Street. And also through Ocean Reeve, who's the publisher, my publisher, and um, everywhere online that you'd expect, like Book Depository, Amazon. I'm on Kindle Unlimited, which is a whole other thing I'm trying to get my head around. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't like ebooks, like reading them. It's I, I like the physical thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm old school like that too. I need to have a physical book. I have made a slight compromise recently with audio books, so because yeah, I can I, yeah. when I'm in the car. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> when I listen to a lot of podcasts when I drive. Um, I like audio books, but I tend to if someone it's I don't know, it's weird. If I listen to a book and they say something that interests me, I like float out the window and I'm like thinking about what they're talking about. And then the, you know, it goes on to the next thing. And I'm like, what? Why are they by a lake? And you've got to rewind to where I was. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I don't know. But um, I don't do that with podcasts, which is weird. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, my website obviously has, I've got YouTube as well. Um, and I've got a blog on my, I'm building. That was another learning curve. I'm not, I don't know. I have a negative connotation to blog. Like I'm a blogger. I'm like, what? Like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. So I'm getting my head around it all. Um, and at the moment on my blog, I've been explaining different concepts that are in the book and like why they're there and what it means. Like, That's really cool. Yeah, because I think, you know, people from the outside looking in, especially with philosophical concepts, they might get the surface level, obviously, and and what they need for the story um, to Mm. understand. But to give them the opportunity to delve deeper into that is really awesome. Yeah, I originally had philosophy in the description of philosophical narrative, and it was not, people don't like it. But I think they think of old Greek men just standing around talking rubbish i think that yeah, yeah. it's a stereotype yeah for yeah. sure <laughs> and when you talk to people about things like how you made that decision or fate or you know like people are very interested in it um yeah why did a certain thing happen and not another one it's just yeah you hear the word philosophy and you're like what are you talking about like yeah um so yeah the most recent one i've done was on the, uh, the opening line says i was lost because i had no place to go none of us do and I took that concept of lost. Um, I made video, I have a YouTube channel. And then I sort of go through all the different sorts of, like you could be spiritually lost, physically lost, and mentally. Um, and then I link that to other references through the book. So it's actually, it's good for me. Yeah, I, yeah, it sort of reassures what I've done. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, it might even spark some inspiration for, you know, extending the concept for some more of your characters and that sort of thing. You know, once you get the cogs turning a bit more and delving deeper into a particular concept, you're you're opening up all these other doors for particular- Definitely. Yeah, it's a good thing with discovery writing too. Like you could write your book, get to the end, and then you can play around with it in edit and say, well, if he's done that, you know, I could have added this here and you can you know, you can uh, deepen your plot. I'm a mind map guy. I love mind maps. Um, Yeah. So I end up with, my wife looked at one the other day and was like, what on earth is that? I'm like, well, he's here, but time's there. So she's like, I I don't get it. She's very mathematical. So everything's like dot point list. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, how boring. I want some spice. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really interesting how everyone has has their very own processes and, and it, it is isn't it? perfect for them, doesn't it? So Yeah, and you get the same end product, but it's like this whole other whole other method. It's a philosophy on its own, that study. Yeah. We look forward to, to the remaining books being released in due time. Absolutely. Yep. I'll be yeah, book two is ready for the editor. So that'll be that'll be in process very quick. I'm aiming for something around April next year, um, just because it takes roughly six months. Um, yeah, and then book three, I'd be aiming not long after that. Yeah. I, I don't know. It'd be interesting. I'll see how much I can do. How much can I do? That's how I'm looking at it. Can I do three books at once? You know, maybe I can. Yeah. Maybe I can do four. See what happens. And I can see you going challenge accepted. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you.